Hello, my name is Judith Ellis and some of you know me from when I worked at Ashburnham Place and I was the East Sussex Hub Director for Westminster Theological Centre. Nowadays I work at Seaford Baptist Church and I want to thank you so much for inviting me to be one of the speakers on the series that you're doing on Nehemiah. So the story so far is that Nehemiah through his relationship with God and a report that he received from a friend, recognized what was breaking God's heart. And he, he engaged his emotions too. And he said, you know, what is breaking your heart is breaking mine too. You see, Jerusalem was breaking God's heart because it was at that time how God really was represented to the other nations. So what was happening to God's people and to the city of Jerusalem was representing who God was to the nations and the city. And actually the people were in ruins. I do wonder if we can draw a parallel today, whether you think that this pandemic has actually caused our cities and towns to really struggle to actually, you know, be in ruins in some way, shape or form. And then last week from Emma, we heard that through prayer, through covenant relationship that Nehemiah had, I think with God and the other people, but particularly with God, he determined to return to Jerusalem. Now, I've just been given three verses from chapter two, uh, verses one to three. And there's just two main characters here in the story, and you may want to act this out. It's really brief. The first character is King Artaxerxes. Now, Artaxerxes is what I would call a fickle person. In other words, one, one minute, kind, generous. The next minute, actually quite vengeful and nasty. And the second character, as we know in this story, is Nehemiah. And actually, in this particular part of the story, Nehemiah is both sad and terrified. We're going to read from the NLT, so chapter 2, verses 1 to 3. You might want to choose, as I say, to just imagine it or to have two people act it out. So chapter 2 and verse 1, reading in the NLT. Early the following spring in the month of Nisan, during the 20th year of King Artaxerxes' reign, I, that's Nehemiah, was serving the king his wine. I had never before appeared sad in his presence. So the king asked me, why are you looking so sad? You don't look sick to me. You must be deeply troubled. Then, I, this is Nehemiah, was terrified, but I replied, Long live the king. How can I not be sad? For the city where my ancestors are buried, it's in ruins and the gates have been destroyed by fire. So this week the story develops as Nehemiah, having prayed about the situation, knows he's actually to be part of the solution with God. Now, he serves the king his wine, as usual, having made sure that it wasn't poisoned by tasting it first. That's what a cupbearer does. Now, some commentators think that Nehemiah was deliberately sad to gain the king's attention. But others think that actually, maybe because he'd been praying and fasting for four months, he just couldn't hide his anguish, his sadness over what was going on in Jerusalem and with the people in Jerusalem at that time. Now, that there's some good reasons why he is absolutely terrified. Firstly, because, you know, the king Artaxerxes is this fickle king, as I mentioned earlier. And the, the second reason is that it was actually this king, King Artaxerxes, 13 years previously, who'd actually put sanctions on Jerusalem after they had actually tried to rebuild it 13 years previously. And he put sanctions on them that, that had caused the city to go into yet further ruin and really affect the people there. 
So Nehemiah was asking a king who's fickle and who had already placed these sanctions on Jerusalem to do something to change his mind. So Nehemiah actually is taking a huge risk here. But the beauty of it is he's spoken with God. He's been in a relationship with God over the last four months. And despite his fear, he still decides that he wants to go with God. He wants to return to Jerusalem with God to actually see the city restored. He is actually quite wise, Nehemiah, in, in the way, and pragmatic actually, in the way he talks to the king. Because no, he doesn't mention Jerusalem. And this is because he knows that the Persians and King Artaxerxes is, is Persian. He knows that they have a really high regard and respect for the dead. And so therefore, to actually talk about burying his ancestors in, you know, in his city, this is something that actually would speak to King Artaxerxes. So I think he's wise and he's pragmatic and he is actually quite clever in the way he approaches his request. Next week, you'll find out how the king actually responds to his request. But for now, we're looking at Nehemiah willing to take this risk and overcoming his fear and wanting to work with God. Now, I, I was given an interesting title uh, for this talk, and it's, it was, uh, the title is A Radical Faith. Now, when I looked up the word radical, it actually means affecting the fundamental nature of something. It is far reaching, it's thorough, it's visionary and involves great or extreme change. Now, actually, the word comes from the Latin root, radix, and it means getting to the root of things. And so, you know, hence the name radish. It's, it's about the root of something. And so, you know, radical is about affecting change by having some kind of root that affects that far reaching change. Now, I wonder what is in your mind when you think of a radical faith. And so I thought what I would do is tell you two of my life stories briefly, don't panic, um, two of my life stories. And I would like you to think about, do you think story number one or story number two actually is a story about radical faith? So the first story, it takes place in the year 2000. And for me, I had heard about a desperate need for teachers in Nepal. And so actually not long afterwards, I applied to BMS, you know, Baptist Missionary Society, as it was then to become a missionary. And what this involved was actually I had to give away most of my things. I didn't have time to sell them. I gave up my home, my car and a, and a very well paid job. I left behind my church that I'd helped lead and people that I loved and within six months had left for Nepal. You know, I stayed for 14 years living in harsh conditions through a 10 year civil war and earthquakes. And while I was there, I set up schools, teacher training centers, mentored local business leaders and helped write a new education policy for Nepal that changed their teaching from a fear-based discipline to a love or child-friendly based classroom. So that's story number one. Do you think that's an example of radical faith? Story number two happened on my return. So it's in 2014 now when I returned to Peacehaven, which is on the South Coast, just here in East Sussex. And I moved in with my mother and actually became her carer for four years before she went to be in a nursing home. So, you know, holding up a finger, do you think story one 
radical faith demonstrates that story too demonstrates a radical faith or neither you see i think neither of these stories demonstrate what a radical faith really is because i actually think the root the radix the, the there's a key element that is missing in both of these stories and actually during my first four years on the mission field in nepal the lord showed me that actually i wasn't living a radical faith and I, it was to do really with the reasons that i was in nepal the reasons that i chose to be a missionary the reason that i was doing things for god at that time and so I'm, I'm about to tell you what it's not a radical faith. See, the first reason that I went, I think, was what is now I understand is called FOMO or fear of missing out on God's blessing if I didn't go to Nepal. You see, partly I went because I thought, it, isn't it the right thing to do? This? Isn't this what a radical faith looks like? But I, I learned that doing the right thing for the wrong reasons from the wrong root isn't a radical faith you see what i've learned is adhering to the right rituals or moral codes isn't what make my faith radical what it is it's a way to control myself to control my surroundings and to control others See, perhaps sometimes my obedience or our obedience to the right morals and rituals comes from a fear of God's wrath or displeasure or, or literally just something bad happening if I don't do the right thing. See, I don't think this type of obedience is a radical faith because it, it's actually based on fear and control. Sometimes I, I really do need to ask my questions now I'm back in the UK and not caring from my mum. You know, why am I attending church? Ritual? Because I don't want to look bad? Why do I stick to a high moral code? You see, following rules and regulations because you don't want something bad to happen or people to think badly of you. That isn't a radical faith. And actually, what was even more surprising to me after I dealt with that first one was that working for God, here the word for God, isn't a radical faith either. And a good illustration is actually the same story that Emma mentioned last week, the prodigal son. You see, the, the son's elder brother is someone who thought that the way to relate to his father the way was to serve him in order to exact the father's favor you know the thought was that this his radical uh, you know faith in his father or accomplishing something for his father or put it in our terms accomplishing something for god enables us to have a radical faith working for god through accomplishments isn't a radical faith it's not about what i do if it was, and, you, and we actually think about this for a minute, what happens as I can do less as I get older, as I, I physically and mentally perhaps deteriorate, as I do less and less for God, does that mean that my faith is less radical the older I get? And I, I, I have such respect and honour. I love chatting with those who are... My, much wiser than I because of life experience, you know, those who are older than me. And some feel a real guilt and a shame because they're not doing enough for God because that's what they think a radical faith is. But it isn't. It's not about doing stuff for God. And I, I, I fell into this trap and it's actually quite a typical trap that a missionary can fall into, that I believed that, you know, doing amazing things for God fulfilling his purposes, you know, changing the world was actually a radical faith. 
what God showed me is that God's mission being put ahead of God himself isn't a radical faith. You know, Matthew 6, 33, I think of where it says, seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness and all these things will be added unto you. This is Jesus sort of summarizing the teachings of the kingdom, about the kingdom of God. And it's about a right relationship with God and others, righteousness, a right relationship with God and others. That's what we seek first. It's not about seeking first his God's mission. It's about seeking God for himself first and foremost. And I, I think this is demonstrated in the, the way that God ultimately chose to restore uh, humanity into a right relationship with him. And it is how, how are we reading the stories in the Old and the New Testament? Because I don't think God's solution to restore a relationship was setting up a list of rules and rituals to follow. In the Old Testament, that wasn't the point of the rules and rituals. It was the, the point wasn't just to do them and be obedient to them. It was actually the point of them was to enable us to love God, to be in his presence. And that's what the rules and regulations were about. They're about love, about relating to God and others. And we can miss the point there. Nor do I think God in his, his, you know, his wisdom of the story of the Old to the New Testament was implementing a list of you know, very useful principles to live by, to restore humanity back into a relationship with him and nor did God give us a task to accomplish to restore the relationship remember I'm talking about relationships here how did God choose <laughs> to radically change us really into kainos beings into new creations that's what the word new is <clears throat> in Greek is new creations is kainos creations how did he choose to restore that relationship? It wasn't about principles. It wasn't about rules and rituals. It wasn't about anything other than giving himself to be with us. Emmanuel. It was about walking with us again. And yet I think it's even more radical than that, that Jesus gave himself so that through the Holy Spirit, Christ actually dwells within us and we in him. The new covenant, his solution to humanity's problems was an intimacy in relationship with him. Such a mysterious intimacy that it's likened by Paul to the joining of a man and a woman. Jesus entered our broken world to radically change it. And the root was his relationship with God at the root the radix of what enabled that to happen was walking and talking and seeing what his father was doing and working with God not for him but with him and actually if you think about it because you and I are in Christ together we are actually in this relationship in Christ. It's about being in him and being connected in a new covenant with each other as well. You see, I in the power was working for God. I was trying to earn brownie points so my life went well and rather than walking with God, rather than chatting to him throughout my day, listening to his gen gentle promptings, delighting in him and him delighting in me. I'd missed the root. I'd missed the key element. 
<clears throat> and I think that's what makes Nehemiah a man of radical faith. It's not what he did, but the kind of relationship that he had with God and with the people of God. And the verse that I was reminded of from this Nehemiah passage, which talks about rebuilding the ancient ruins. Jesus quoted from this chapter in the Old Testament when he said, well, this this is the point. <laughs> in Luke 4, verse 18 onwards, he's quoting Isaiah 61. And, and I just want to read this passage before we spend a bit of time in prayer. So Isaiah 61. The spirit of the sovereign Lord is upon me and the Lord has anointed me to bring good news to the poor. He has sent me to comfort the brokenhearted and to proclaim that captives will be released and prisoners will be freed. He has sent me to tell those who mourn that the time of the Lord's favour has come. Now, Jesus doesn't mention part B of verse 2, so I'm not going to either. Verse 3 says, To all who mourn, he will give a crown of beauty instead of their ashes, a joyous blessing instead of mourning, festive praise, i.e. hope instead of despair. In their, and this is a key word, the key root, righteousness, they will be like great oaks that the Lord has planted for his own glory. They, <laughs> that's the people who have, who are broken hearted. That's the people who've been held captive by their sin and other people's sin. Those are the people who feel like they're in prison. These people who are mourning and grieving and feel like their life was um, ashes. These people who are in despair. These are the people who coming into a right relationship with God in their righteousness through what Jesus now has done on the cross. It's that right relationship with God. It's that walking with God. As a result of that, they rebuild the ancient ruins, repair cities destroyed long ago. They will revive them, though they have been deserted for many generations. So what if radical faith is broken people who grieve and mourn and feel despair, yet wake up each day and ask God what he and they are going to do together today? They're in right relationship with him. You know, and God may say, well, how about watching a movie together? So, because there's something I want to show you in the story. Or it could be that he says, how about ringing someone to bind up their broken heart or make them glad? Or maybe go for a walk and it could involve praying around the area. It could involve listening to someone who's grieving at this time. Or it could be giving up all your possessions to share with the good news to the poor in heart with those in another country. Or it could be staying at home, raising the children God has gifted you with. But remember, the examples that I've just given you aren't what makes our faith radical. What causes the, the root of far-reaching change is about walking with God. It's about our relationship with God. It's about seeking him. It's about being connected in covenant with him. It's about our heart posture with him and actually with others. I don't think anyone can define what a radical faith looks like for you. See, your walking with God, being connected in communion with him, will be different to mine as you were created unique. Uh, you're one of a kind. 
And remember too that the covenant of the Christ being in us and we in him means that I am eternally connected to you and you to me. <laughs> the covenant is both with Christ and with one another. That's the New Testament covenant. I am with you because you are in Christ and so am I. So what if a radical faith is about remaining in constant connection with God? Even when words are not exchanged. What if faith is actually the opposite of seeking control? It's surrendering the illusion of control that we have built up in our lives. And we can only do this I surrender the control when we have such a deep relationship with God that we truly trust him. Whatever the surroundings, whatever's going on, we truly trust him. Radical faith. Now today I believe through prayer that the Lord wants to lift off some guilt and shame that perhaps has been placed on you or by, by yourself or by others of what perhaps a radical faith should look like. You see, the words should, ought, need, must are red flags to me. They, they're controlling words. And I don't think the kingdom of God is about control. It's not about fear. It is about love. It is about connectedness. It is about covenant. And it is about free will to choose life, to choose relationship with God each day, to remain connected with him. It's not about what we do. It's about our relationship with him that makes it a radical faith. So I'm going to pray for those who perhaps have been burdened by some of the things that is talked about in Isaiah 61. And we've been perhaps burdened by guilt and shame at this time you know shame often makes us want to hide and so it's almost like lifting that paper bag off your head or guilt is that burden but just enable you to walk tall that a radical faith is connecting and staying connected with God let's pray Lord I pray that those who feel burdened by expectations put on themselves or by others I pray for those too who are held captive by religious rules and regulations. I pray for those too who feel despair as a result of physical or mental or emotional illness. And I pray also for those who are grieving and mourning at this time. And what I pray is that right now, Lord Jesus, through the presence of God's spirit, the burden of guilt, the burden of despair, the burden of being held captive, the burden of following religious rules and regulations in the name of Jesus will be lifted. And I pray that hope will begin to replace the despair and comfort will come to those who are grieving. Oh, I pray, Holy Spirit, that you will bind up the brokenhearted and you release those held captive by others' sin. And I pray for all of us to have a courage to walk with God, to remain in his presence all the days of our life and to be rooted, to be radixed into that relationship with him. I pray that moment by moment, day by day, prompted by his voice and prompted by his love we live a radical faith with God amen again thank you for inviting me to speak with you today some of the thoughts that I picked up today are from a book that I've recommended in the place that I've been asked to put it and it's called with and it's about reimagining the way you relate to God by Sky Jathani. Hopefully you'll get a chance to look it up. Blessings on you. Bye for now.